to be on the losing team. That's not actually a thing they desire, so we need to stop doing that. All right, ready? The fun continues. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna scale it up a level, metaphors. So, many, many people have done a lot of work on this, some at Berkeley, some many other places. Um, there is a thing called conceptual metaphor. These are not precisely the metaphors that you were tortured with once upon a time in English class, but they're closely related. These are the metaphors that occur at a level of speech of which we are not consciously aware. So when I say that lecture just flew right by me and I couldn't really grasp her meaning and I'll have to chew that over and I couldn't really swallow what she was saying. It's because we have a metaphor in English of ideas being like objects or more specifically like food, right? Any concept that is intangible, that doesn't have a shape or a weight or a form, we make sense of it and we talk about it by likening it to something tangible. And it turns out that these conceptual metaphors actually influence how people come to judgments about public policy issues. So again, in another experiment, this was uh, Paul Thibodeau, Lara Borditsky again, um, they brought people into their lab, had them think of themselves as the members of a fictional town council. And they were asked to resolve the problem of crime in this fictional town and provided statistics. This was the murder rate, this was the assault rate, this is how it changed from year X to year Y. But half the sample was primed with a metaphor that likens um, crime in the aggregate to a virus, which you can hear in language like crime is spreading or infesting or plaguing. The other half got opponent language, which isn't strictly metaphorical, but doesn't matter, which you can hear in language like fight crime, beat back crime, get tough, but only one sentence. I'm just providing you multiple language examples of this metaphor at work. And then everyone was asked, what would you do about crime in this town? The people who had seen the virus sentence were much more likely to, to implement or to want preventative solutions. So they wanted after school for all, they wanted preschool, right? They wanted things that would essentially abate crime before it had occurred. The people who had seen the opponent language wanted mandatory sentencing and tougher sentencing and three strikes laws. And of course, when everyone is asked upon what did you base your recommendation, they say, the data, the facts, the statistics. Because we all want to believe ourselves creatures of reason that are guided by the information before us. But in fact, in reality, we can only know what we think that we think. The vast majority of thought is not within our conscious purview. So in a similar example that I ran with Paul, who ran, uh, was one of the authors of that previous experiment, Again, people brought into a lab and we described economic inequality to them in the general, the normal way that it, economists do. This quintile has this much, this quintile has that much, this quintile. And for half the sample, we used the most common way of describing inequality. There's a gap between rich and poor. And for the other half, we said the economy is increasingly off balance. Then we asked everybody, do you think that inequality is a problem for the economy overall? Our gap people, 80% of them said no, and 20% said yes. The exact opposite proportion was true for our off-balance people. 80% said yes, it was problematic to the whole economy, and 20% said it wasn't. So why would that be? But again, they were presented the same numbers, right, about how much each quintile has. Yeah. If it's a gap and I'm answering this question, I probably identify myself as in the safe zone in the middle, but if I'm off balance, then we're all on a spectrum. Yes, because a gap implies that quote unquote separate economic universes are possible. When in fact, people are as poor as they are because people are as rich as they are. There is one economy, even at the global level, and when the entire system is contextualized and understood unconsciously as a system, then something wrong in one part of the system is obviously going to affect the entirety. But if there's a gap, 
you know, oh, look, there's poor island over there. Sucks to be you. Glad I'm hanging out over here. And there's a second problem with Gap, which is why I hate it. And I'm like on a one woman anti-Gap crusade, which has had basically no success. Because not only is Gap the number one thing we say, you know, there's a gap between rich and poor. There's a racial wealth gap. There's an earnings gap. There's, I've heard now, a climate gap. There's health disparities. There's an achievement gap. This concept has metastasized into all of discourse. So the second problem with Gap is that which part of the story is it? Is it the beginning of the story, the middle, or the end? It tells us what? The thing A is apart from thing B. Thing A has lots of money. Thing B has no money. Thing A has excellent mortality and morbidity. Thing B has bad mortality and morbidity, right? Thing A has good grades. Thing B has bad grades. Which part of the story is that? Beginning, middle, or end? End. I told you earlier that if you do not establish that a problem is person-made, it is cognitively inconsistent to believe that it could be person-fixed. A gap is a natural phenomenon. When we do not tell people an origin story, they fill one in for themselves. And do you know what story they tell about why some people have lots of money and some people have no money? What story do they tell? They deserve it. Right, some people are really made out of awesome and they're smarter and they work harder and some people suck. Same goes for health disparities, same goes for educational attainment. So when we let the origin story not be articulated, that's when we come back to context. Remember my profile, my full face, my profile, my full face, right? So what are the stories that people have heard all their lives, especially in the US, about the way the world works and what's true and, and common sense. The story they've been told is one of rugged individualism and people doing for themselves. So if we're silent about origin, they fill in a story with whatever is most routinely available to them, which is not helpful or accurate. Yeah? Cannot stand this word. <laughs> like it to die. So going back to conceptual metaphor, the way that they work is that you have a source domain and a target domain. So the source domain is what is the actual language that you're using? So when we say crime is infesting or it's spreading, that source domain is the language of disease, right? It's the language of viruses or infections. When we say I couldn't grasp her meaning and I couldn't swallow what she was saying and I have to chew that over. The source domain is either object or food, which is a specific kind of an object, yeah? When we say he was a warm person, she gave me the cold shoulder, the source domain is obviously temperature. Those are temperature words. The target domain is the thing we are trying to describe. So in the first example, we're trying to describe crime in the aggregate. In the second example, we were trying to describe, I already forgot which example I did in which order, which is really awesome. Um, what was my second example? It was ideas. We're trying to describe ideas, yeah? So what we know is that what is true about the source domain, what's true about food, or what's true about viruses, or what's true about physical gaps, about physical distances, gets transferred onto the thing we're trying to explain. Economic inequality, crime, ideas, 